Hi everyone, um, it's great uh, to be talking to you, it's great to have this opportunity to uh, tell you a little bit about um, the state of the art uh, in terms of research um, and uh, clinical information that we have on maladaptive daydreaming. Uh, I wish to introduce to you today a psychological phenomenon that um, to my mind is gaining significant scientific and clinical interest but still is quite unknown and uh, most professionals haven't heard about it and the same goes for academic circles. There's one group, uh, however, uh, who is very familiar with it and these are people who have been struggling with this problem. Uh, some of you out there uh, might be watching this video because um, you have a first-hand uh, experience with this phenomena. Uh, at any rate, uh, students, scholars, interested people and uh, consumers, uh, you are all welcome. I have a, an ambitious outline today. Um, but uh, I might not have enough time to cover all, all the slides, but uh, let, let's give it a try because uh, I think I've covered uh, you know, all that we know almost uh, in this little field. So what is the essence of the phenomena I wish to introduce to you this, uh, on, on this uh, video? Um, we will come back to this slide uh, later on, but I thought it, it would be necessary to present it at the onset of my talk. Um, I will attempt to differentiate um, maladaptive daydreaming from existing related, off-task, self-generated mental activities. But first, take a look at the features of this construct as, as we understand it. This is uh, taken from uh, the seminal paper uh, um, from 2002 in which this term was uh, first coined. So we're talking about a fantasy activity. So this is not uh, like um, uh, thinking about uh, daily events or reminiscing. This is a fantasy activity that is volitional, so it's not a failure in attention like my, my, my mind wandering might be. It's a volitional act that, uh, that involves scripting extensive, absorptive, very fanciful plots. And what is unique about this is there is some movement involved, kinesthesia. People who do this very frequently um, uh, report pacing or rocking or shaking their hands. Um, and an ad additional uh, characteristic feature is listening to evocative music. Many people report that in order to uh, uh, trigger um, uh, this form of fantasy, they require uh, a certain kind of music to set the tone and that the music is important uh, to maintain the fantasy. Uh, Additionally, what is uh, uh, characteristic of this mental activity is that it is extremely rewarding. Um, and many individuals coping with this report it as a sort of a compulsion or an addiction because uh, they have a need to repeat it because it's so fun, so much fun. It, uh, it, but as in any addiction, um, that starts with fun, uh, like recreational drugs or gambling, which is a behavioral addiction. Um, and adaptive daydreaming eventually creates distress. Uh, it can also interfere with the completion of daily chores, um, that uh, to include school or, or work, or even uh, interacting with family and friends. People prefer to do that rather than attend to their other um, mundane daily activities. So let's move on now. Now that we defined the term, the pathological term, you may wonder um, uh, why, is, why am I pathologizing uh, daydreaming? And indeed, uh, daydreaming uh, it needs to be acknowledged um, is a normal and very prevalent 
uh, mental activity that most people engage in on a daily basis for brief periods of time. The term is used loosely to refer to a wide variety of mentations, including self-talk and thinking. So to add clarity, we need more precise definitions to differentiate between all these different mental activities. So let's take a look at, at daydreaming. Let's stay there. Uh, Singer and Klinger, these are prominent scholars in this field, regarded uh, daydreaming as a childhood activity. A childhood activity that is associated with uh, play. It is creative, it is playful. And as I read the re literature on maladaptive daydreaming, the nature uh, <coughs> of the daydreaming phenomenology often remains somewhat uh, loosely defined. It's uh, not quite clear what people mean when they refer to daydreaming. What is more clearly described is the function of daydreaming. So daydreaming research suggests that uh, most of these self-generated uh, mentations um, uh, referring now to daydreaming interact with the external experience. So uh, I've emphasized in red on the slide Daydreaming has an adaptive role in the realm of plan preparation and rehearsal, emotional regulation, motivation, and learning from success and failure. People simply uh, uh, imagine uh, future activity and rehearse them proactively, sometimes retroactively, to learn from mistakes and to understand uh, experiences they that they have gone through. Um, so now let's shift our interest a little bit uh, to a more extensive form of daydreaming and many of you uh, uh, might have heard of the term fantasy prone personality. This is the closest construct to uh, maladaptive daydreaming, um, although it does not connote when you look at the term, doesn't connote uh, psychopathology necessarily. Um, this construct, as I said, does have some overlap with uh, daydreaming. However, the fantasy-prone personality is unique in that it has a measure as defined by the uh, uh, scholars who developed and coined this term, a measure that is called the inventory of childhood imaginings, that assesses among other things, assesses childhood events you know, rather than current experiences because we want a measure that measures the mental activity. That is, uh, in, uh, in addition to a variety of mystical experiences that seem to have little face validity as far as daydreaming or maladaptive daydreaming are concerned, it also asks about childhood experiences. Uh, so the, world, the words that I colored in red on the, on the slide that is presented to you stand for the distinctiveness of fantasy proneness and, 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 and emphasize what sets it apart from maladaptive daydreaming. So let's look at the third bullet. Uh, these people tend to live in a world of imagery, imagination and fantasy, hypnotizable, um, encouraged to fantasize as a child, uh, they report mystical or paranormal experiences, they believe they have healing powers, and so on and so forth. So uh, all, all of these uh, uh, properties and attributes are, uh, to the best of my understanding, unrelated to maladaptive daydreaming. Still, what is noteworthy is that Rauschenberger and Lynn assess that up to 6% of the population are fantasy prone. So the proclivity to for excessive daydreaming uh, uh, as measured by their construct is definitely not rare. Um, it, it um, uh, in fact, um, uh, is, is, a, is a variation perhaps of, of uh, normal daydreaming. 
Recently, however, there have been other, other constructs. Uh, by, uh, by the way, we used fantasy prongs as the criterion against which we developed and compared our measure of maladaptive daydreaming because there was none existent before, no, no equivalent term. So we used that as our uh, uh, criterion uh, to measure uh, the, the uh, construct validity. So, but let's look at, uh, at mind wandering. It's a very popular and uh, widely researched term. Uh, and unlike mind wandering, uh, uh, unlike daydreaming, I'm sorry, I've alluded to this early, earlier, mind wandering is seen as the mind's idle mode. In this state, the mind is said to wander unintentionally. It, is, it wanders into remembering, into thinking and planning. And although normal, it is regarded by, the, by scholars in this field as an attentional failure. Something is not working right when one's mind wanders in terms of uh, attention. And what sets it, sets it apart from maladaptive daydreaming is that it is not, uh, uh, mind wandering is not seen as a volitional act of internal focusing. Again, the contents of mind wandering is described as a dialogue with a person's external reality and that is not necessarily the case and often not the case in maladaptive daydreaming. So what do we have here? Let's again look at the slide that what I've highlighted there. It's a ubiquitous psychological ba uh, baseline from which people venture when attention is demanded. Uh, it's a motley of reflections and remembering and anticipation of future moments, seen as an attentional failure. And, um, uh, and, and in terms of contents, it has it's related to autobiography or simulation of plausible alternatives. I'm putting this emphasis on plausible because, again, in maladaptive daydreaming, there could be fantasies associated with wishful thinking and, and so on. Some of them, of these wishful thinking, uh, may have um, uh, contents that, that could be attainable. But a lot of the daydreaming is often reported to be uh, of fantastical nature. Another related term is the default mode network. And uh, for those of you who are not from you know, this field of uh, brain studies, uh, you'd have to tolerate uh, these technical terms. But this is uh, another important uh, uh, term. Uh, Again, the default mode network is uh, uh, an area in the cortex, the, um, uh, the outer layer of the brain, that lightens up during mind wandering. So these, these again, these are the, me the mechanisms, the brain mechanisms that are associated with interaction with reality in, in, in the mind. They address the person's past and future, but these mechanisms are not described as involving fanciful fantasy. So to put it uh, <clears throat> more simply, the evidence regarding uh, mind, uh, uh, mind wandering might shed little light on the volitional fanciful fantasy life of people with maladaptive daydreaming. Uh, <clears throat> and I think our challenge is, uh, if we ever uh, get to the stage of conducting brain imaging studies, is to uh, show uh, what areas of the brain light up when people are off task and mind wandering and their default and, and compared to people with maladaptive daydreaming. And more specifically, the question is, are people who are focusing intently on their inner world activating the default mode network or perhaps other brain areas. Another clinical term that is associated with daydreaming is sluggish cognitive tempo. I don't like the term. It has a derogatory uh, flavor to it, but uh, this term is used to define a syndrome 
that is described as including two clusters of symptoms. First, being lost in thoughts or daydreaming, and so the, here is a potential overlap with fantasy proneness and mind wandering. And the other cluster of symptoms is physical and mental slowness and fatigue, a feature not present in daydreaming or in maladaptive daydreaming. In other words, although sluggish cognitive tempo may share some common features with the propensity for extensive uh, daydreaming, it is described as a syndrome involving an overall slowdown, cognitive and also physical, a feature that does not appear in maladaptive daydreaming and therefore is distinct from it. Um, those of us interested in maladaptive daydreaming <coughs> and who have talked with the individuals who cope with this uh, um, uh, mental activity, uh, know that the origins of this disorder or this um, construct uh, is rooted in childhood. And most people, I mean, it is very rare. I, I don't, in fact, I don't remember if I even met one person who reported that maladaptive daydreaming erupted de novo during adulthood. So what are the childhood origins or antecedents of uh, maladaptive daydreaming? Well, the answer to that might have been hiding in plain sight. Stereotypical movement disorder is a DSM, uh, a psychoneurological disorder that is in the DSM associated with, uh, first observed uh, typically in childhood. And, um, <coughs> and again, um, um, I, I must say that um, I've been in touch with <coughs> individuals who are um, studying um, stereotypical movement disorder. There's a group in Canada, there's a group in the United Kingdom, and these experts suggest that uh, among children with this neurological, uh, psychoneurological uh, uh, problem, there's a subgroup of children that um, uh, display a unique pattern of behaviors that include not only the stereotypical movements, but also daydreaming. They report that a lot is going on in the mind with contents taken often from car cartoons or, or, or children's stories. Um, and also noteworthy is the fact that um, the children are reported to enjoy uh, this mental activity, indicating, again, its rewarding characteristics and the potential for uh, habit formation. Um, the next slide, I'm not sure, uh, it, it involves a little, a little video, but because of technical reasons, I'm not going to show it uh, now. But what you see is uh, there's an open door there. And by the way, this is public domain, uploaded on YouTube, and there are many, many such testimonies, both of adults talking about their own experiences and also parents filming their own children and asking in this um, social uh, media, for comments and advice. So in this um, video, uh, there's a girl filmed by her mother who is on the bed. You can see the, the, a dog lying on the bed. <coughs> and the child moves back and forth with a dual awareness. She is in, obviously Im immersed in her own fantasy, moving her head and, and uh, sort of oblivious to what's going on and to her mother. But she doesn't bump uh, into the furniture as she walks back and forth. She purposely then, at the end of this brief video, video sits on the sofa, in, uh, you see it sort of backed up to the wall there, and moves a curl of hair that seems to stimulate her face. So, um, although she seems lost in her, in her world, she's not entirely lost, she's not entirely oblivious uh, to sensations emanating from her body. 
and, and, and certainly not entirely oblivious to the surrounding because she is walking on a particular path uh, with, uh, with success, without, uh, without uh, bumping into furniture. So uh, yeah, okay. I, I've, it does it does move. Uh, she she holds an object uh, in her hand, and is talking to herself, gesturing. I guess appropriately to what is going on in her mind. Okay, so this um, subgroup of, of children with stereotypical movement disorder um, have been identified by a group of uh, um, uh, scientist practitioners in London um, who have recently coined the term and uh, added to this already complicated nomenclature um, the term intense imagery movements. So again, an, apparently an identical syndrome to stereotypical movement disorder, but uh, <clears throat> note that in the title of the construct, the emphasis now is more on the imagery or the fantasy rather than the movements. And again, these uh, clinicians, uh, scientists, uh, practitioners indicate that um, IIM seem to interfere with daily functioning and the well-being of these children. So let's go back to the uh, uh, definition that I've started with. Uh, uh, so we are talking again about something uh, different uh, and undescribed before. Um, perhaps uh, an adult version of IIM or stereotypical movement disorder with this specific component of fantasy. By the way, the, I'm also aware of one or two studies um, coming from Canada on stereotypic movement disorder reporting a subgroup of children who enjoy their fantasy and report that, that this is what they're doing. Let's, let's review now a brief history of this construct. Again, this 2002 paper, um, um, how, how was it born? Um, I am a scientist practitioner myself. I specialize in trauma-related and dissociative disorders. And my initial observations of maladaptive daydreaming were made in my trauma practice. So as you would expect, the patients who displayed maladaptive daydreaming who, uh, whom I first met, reported a significant trauma history. And in the next slide, um, marked in, <coughs> in blue, you see the history of these six patients the first reported in this extended case study in 2002. Uh, they all had moderate to severe childhood adversities. Um, so this led me to believe that somehow this is another dis form of, of a dissociative disorder, beginning at first uh, perhaps as a defense mechanism against um, uh, intolerable reality and inescapable reality uh, by forming an alternative reality in which the child has better control and perhaps forms better attachments. All right, so this uh, 2002 paper um, uh, seemed to have very little uh, uh, impact on the scientific community, or so it seemed to me throughout uh, these years. However, individuals um, uh, struggling uh, with this um, uh, mental behavior uh, did what um, millennials and, and, and um, young adults do today. They search the internet for information. <coughs> and many have found the paper online. And the term um, 
that has been adopted uh, by the mal by the maladaptive daydreaming community has really gone viral. So it's a term that has not existed prior to 2002. And um, uh, what you can see here is an immense consumer interest. Uh, um, the exact term maladaptive daydreaming in Google yields over 200,000 results. Um, what does it mean? This is this is in very. Th this means that there is a need out there. There is a great interest out there, uh, not by scholars, I believe, but by consumers. And indeed, what ensued later is a growing <coughs> consumer pressure on me and and others um, uh, who have collaborated with me to uh, con contribute further knowledge on this field. We described this in this paper that, was, that is uh, open access and available online. And I must admit that you know, I continued to, I, you know, I was on a track of um, the clinical work and, and research on trauma and dissociation, but this ongoing pressure that I will show you some examples of uh, <coughs> particularly reflected in emails uh, sent to me uh, almost on a daily basis from all cor corners of the world. This pressure contributed to my own motivation to resume uh, the maladaptive daydreaming research. And um, so from zero mentions uh, in the web in 2001, uh, here we are at uh, over 200,000 results. You can also see this when um, you know the change in public interest in maladaptive daydreaming over time uh, by uh, looking at um, Google Trends. <coughs> and here I entered fantasizing and mind wandering. Fantasizing is the more lay term. Mind wandering is the existing, I guess, competing term and maladaptive daydreaming. And as you can see, a maladaptive daydreaming is pretty flat there on the bottom in two th still in 2007 with uh, fantasizing and mind wandering showing stable interest over time until, until today. But what happens to maladaptive daydreaming, these in incredible peaks and, and surge of interest. And uh, uh, the uh, concomitant, concomitant uh, outcome of this is, uh, is the, was, was and still is the mushrooming of consumer activity on the web. Uh, it's really signaled the need to be heard and to be helped. Uh, so internet communities were created in, in many languages and continents. Uh, and since um, maladaptive daydreaming uh, was and still is uh, an unrecognized clinical syndrome, consumers uh, needed help. And those who needed help and also were computer savvy uh, uh, went up for help um, and sought help uh, among uh, I internet communities. So they created their own uh, environment in which they could talk, describe, and be supported without being dismissed or, or, or ridiculed. Face groups, Facebook groups were, uh, were established, again, in many languages. Listservs and, and other support groups <coughs> online were formed. And if you look carefully, um, the Yahoo group consists, when, when uh, this uh, screenshot was taken, uh, over 3,300 members. And <coughs> this other group, uh, 1,400 members, and so on and so forth. And there are numerous of such groups. <coughs> YouTube testimonies were uploaded, and people talking, uh, you know, with a face uh, shown. They really are courageous, and I think their work is important because YouTube is also social media, and this generates discussions and and uh, a sort of a maladaptive daydreaming 
Me Too type of uh, phenomena uh, that it, uh, minimally gives people the sense that they are not alone out there <coughs> and people share ideas and, uh, and thoughts on, on, uh, on, on how to regulate their daydreaming. <coughs> um, again, these testimonials, I'm not violating any privacy uh, uh, um, issues here because these testimonials are free, open domains, free domains available on YouTube for you know, anybody interested or for study and analysis. As I found out later, um, um, th this, this uh, phenomenon was also uh, uh, characterized by an inundation of emails. I mean, this is a sample, you know, with identities disguised. Again, for years, not a week goes by without my receiving multiple inquiries and, and requests for information for consumers, and that's, you know, healthy. Uh, but again, showed me a need and motivated me even further to, um, uh, to do my best to contribute to knowledge and the recognition of Maladaptive daydreaming. In the meantime, uh, my research gate co copy of the original 2002 paper was read over 2,000 times and was cited 29 times. I'm not sure, uh, you know, I'm, I don't think I've read all the papers who have cited it, but I'm sure not all of them deal with maladaptive dating. In fact, I know that, you know, this, uh, many of the papers are just citing this as a, as a possibility of daydreaming that can go awry. Um, um, but, what I <coughs> later fi found out that uh, indeed I was not alone and apparently unbeknownst to me other scholars started showing interest in this phenomena. For example, uh, the case study on the right reported a successful treatment with uh, selective serot serot serotonin reup uh, reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs. This is a, was an individual with maladaptive daydreaming, with no reported history of um, child abuse, uh, whose psychiatrists believed that um, uh, might meet uh, criteria for an uh, OCD spectrum disorder, and uh, conceptualized maladaptive daydreaming as a form of OCD, and prescribed medication commonly prescribed for OCD. And again, the, the, the patient is free of symptoms uh, since then. The paper on the left uh, uh, was the first paper to analyze responses of um, a, a, a fairly larger amount of uh, individuals, 90 self-diagnosed individuals, who, who re responded to a call for participation uh, posted on select online communities. Uh, so I later on contacted these authors and we've collaborated. Um, um, let me see, uh, yeah, this is the slide I wanted to show you. But what you see uh, um, here is an incredible uh, interest uh, by the media in maladaptive daydreaming. This is taken from a website that we are uh, maintaining on, on the topic. And as you can see, BBC, The Atlantic, Wall Street Journal uh, are only among uh, many uh, important media outlets who have contacted uh, me and others uh, to develop stories um, on this. Um, why would uh, these important media outlet be so interested in, in, in this rather esoteric or obscure mental condition? I'm not sure, but perhaps the novelty of it, um, in combination with the pertinence of dissociative disorder <coughs> to a wide, a wide audience, explains 
some of this media attention and maybe even some of the um, uh, of the editors or, or reporters uh, were familiar with someone who had this. Um, the media coverage included primetime human interest stories uh, in, in some leading TV outlets. Uh, Huffington Post Live, CBS News, CNN, uh, BBC World News um, are among uh, those who featured the story. Um, but uh, again, um, if you, if you want to look at these stories, we've uploaded them, and this is the web address. If you, if you Google daydreaming research, I'm sure you will get, you will find our website. Uh, we have talked to over 2,000 individuals from all corners of the world, with, uh, who, individuals who self-diagnose themselves as having maladaptive daydreaming. They volunteer to take part in uh, qualitative and quantitative research. The next slide I'm going to show very briefly shows split screens of me interviewing these individuals. And again, when the science of a certain um, phenomena as it is at its infancy, it's important to gather information when you don't have hypotheses yet. Uh, from the consumers, from those experts by experience who could tell you um, what is it like. And we learned a lot from these individuals. Uh, still, the field is in its infancy. Uh, however, despite that, scientific interest is gaining momentum and we have published several good peer papers in peer-reviewed journals and more are coming. There's several in press, several submitted, and several studies are um, now in, in progress. Um, hot of the press, here is a study published this week. Uh, no, no, it was, I would say, this month. But by the time you see it, it might be old already. Uh, <coughs> It provides evidence about the relevance of maladaptive daydreaming in a non-English speaking culture. And it highlights the potential value of this uh, assessment tool, the maladaptive daydreaming scale, for worldwide investigation of this condition. So you might know that there is such a, such a scale, such an instrument, the, the 16 item maladaptive daydreaming scale. You know, in the future, we may be able to, uh, to find out that perhaps we don't need as many as 16 items. Uh, but um, I'm, I'm happy to say that um, um, our research is based on a solid measure. We have other measures, like the maladaptive daydreaming scale. And um, it demonstrated good validity, good consistency, internal and temporal stability. And this, uh, this scale discriminated well between self-identified individuals with and without maladaptive daydreaming. So considering the instrument's high sensitivity, it can really detect well those who have maladaptive daydreaming, and specificity, meaning that they don't uh, they uh, uh, include or wrongly identify people who don't have it as having the disorder. Given all these properties that we've demonstrated, it seems like an excellent measure to study maladaptive daydreaming. Uh, look, we have 26 translations um, of the instrument. This is um, because, again, of the consumers uh, volunteering to do translation. Some of the consumers, people who are coping with, with maladaptive daydreaming, uh, know individuals who have maladaptive daydreaming. Some, many of them were uh, mental health professionals themselves, uh, some struggling with, the, uh, pro with, the, with this problem. So uh, many of these translations are really high quality uh, uh, versions um, of of the, of the, of the instrument, and currently it's being translated in, into Vietnamese, 
and into India's uh, main languages, Hindi and Marathi. Uh, so again, it's a grassroots effort, and um, um, it's, it, it's the consumers out there who, ne who uh, are to be thanked for it. And you know, contrary to uh, cri criticism sometimes of psychology and psychiatry that it tends to over pathologize normal behaviors, here we have a different trend. We have not, you know, the, cons the individuals out there being victimized by this uh, establishment of psychiatry, but rather them uh, reaching out, a grassroots effort to have their suffering uh, be acknowledged, studied, so they could have some uh, recourse eventually. Um, we recently performed, uh, and, and we are still analyzing, um, a, an exploratory, exploratory network analysis on the items of the maladaptive daydreaming scale. Uh, the, the items are marked by numbers and blue lines indicate positive relationships and red lines indicate negative relationships and the strength of the association is indicated by the thickness of the lines connecting uh, the items. Uh, so this kind of analysis aims at identifying the item clusters in the data and what this analysis that we haven't published yet tells us is that the construct of maladaptive dating has three solid components. The unique physical sensory feature of the movement, plus the importance of exposure to music, this is one cluster. The rewarding or addictive property of maladaptive daydreaming is another cluster, you can see it visually. And the impairment it causes is the third cluster. We also developed a, a, a DSM-style diagnostic criteria for a fu a future nosology of a daydreaming disorder. DSM stands for Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders of the American Psychiatric Association. And uh, here you have you know, the suggested diagnostic criteria. We tested them. Uh, it will be too technical to go through them. them. They are all online on our website. Uh, <clears throat> and um, we also developed an interview like the SCID, the Structured Clinical Interview for the DSM. So we developed a SCID style interview for maladaptive daydreaming um, and the, the data are very encouraging. Uh, we had two clinicians blind to the diagnosis of those referred to them for assessment, um, applying the structured clinical interview for maladaptive daydreaming and the degree of uh, inter-rater agreement was very high co compared to uh, other DSM disorders. So we're pleased with that. Um, as I told you, we've gathered a lot of qualitative data on maladaptive daydreaming. They are important, as I said, in, early, in the early stages, in the early exploration of a new construct, because they provide rich information from the experts, the consumers, on the essence of, of the uh, experience in question. So actually, we collected three, um, we, co we collected the data that I'm showing to you and, and in other slides before we conducted the quantitative research presented uh, so far. Uh, but because of time limitations, I will not be able to present all the qualitative data in this uh, video lecture. Uh, but those who wish to appreciate the full richness uh, of our respondents' description, you could go to our website again and download the papers. Please note that some of the features later captured by the maladaptive daydreaming scale network analysis I showed you a moment ago were indeed first reported by the consumers during our in-depth interview. So these are the main features um, that our qualitative data revealed 
And the question that I've asked myself, you know, being a uh, dissociation scholar and clinician, uh, <coughs> maladaptive daydreaming is essentially about absorption internal absorption. And absorption is a subscale, a subconstruct of, of dissociation, considered, by the way, by my colleagues as, as a normal form of dissociation. So I asked myself, to what extent is maladaptive daydreaming dissociative? And we have some data to indicate that it definitely is a form of dissociation. It definitely is about absorption, but it is an abnormal form of absorption. And here are some, uh, some of the evidence that show the similarity of, uh, in, in terms of the origins, uh, the, um, the development of maladaptive daydream, the, sim the similarity to uh, other more severe dissociative disorders. So distancing from painful childhood adversities is something that we heard. Not everyone has had childhood adversities uh, to report, but here are some examples. I grew up with some physical but mostly emotional abusive people. I was always a scapegoat. There were fights between the parents and they would blame their problems on me, screaming on the top of their lungs at me for hours and hours every night. Uh, <clears throat> one way of coping uh, seemed to have been the creation of an alternative reality capable of providing these children a soothing and a virtual experience of safety and love that they have missed in their real lives. So I believe that in some cases, dissociative disorder um, develop under similar circumstances and a, ca a capacity to dissociate or to be absorbed in daydreaming interacts with the trauma and the resulting relief increases the likelihood of repeat and of uh, and it intensifies the utilization of this coping mechanism. So here is how one respondent described the, 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 the rewarding properties of creating an alternative reality. This is the second quote, I would daydream about family mainly a brother and a sister, about 17 years of age, very beautiful and successful, and they were each other's best friends and felt deep love for each other, something I never had in reality. Again, and beneath the quotes you have the, the sources, they are online on our website, you can download them. Another pathway to the development of maladaptive daydreaming is probably associated with the fact that some individuals learn to satisfy their unmet childhood psychological needs through their fantasies. So they achieve the emotional sustenance from their daydreaming, that again, because it's so real. Uh, so again, let's look at the second quote. I hated every aspect of my life and needed to get as far away from that as possible. As a teenager, I started daydreaming about my life. I imagined myself having a different life. And again, if we look at this recent post that I received, uh, it describes all these features of um, you know, the, the need for the daydreaming, but also the uh, maladaptation that it causes eventually, you know, despite its obvious benefits. So this message addresses a Facebook group administrator and, and the group members. Uh, let's go back to the question of to what extent is it dissociative? Uh, maladaptive daydreaming can it, it, it also provides with compensatory experiences. They are necessary for the healing of, uh, of, of the soul and of the damaged self-image. Uh, most of the time my daydreams have a good ending for me. Often I become rich. I'll dream that I'm getting some power like a 
payback to everybody who told me that I would be an unsuccessful person. I stand tall and I say, I did it. I got what I wanted in life. Mom should be proud. But we also have statistical uh, evidence that confirms that maladaptive daydreaming is associated with uh, dissociative experiences. Here you have a correlation uh, matrix between the maladaptive daydreaming scale and the dissociative experiences scale, the DS. Uh, <coughs> and um, what is noteworthy is the intensity of the relationship with absorption previously considered to be the least pathological experience of dissociation. So our data showed that absorption can be psychopathological and that maladaptive daydreaming is closely related to dissociative absorption experiences as measured by this most widely used dissociative measure, the DS. And what is noteworthy for those of you who are statistically savvy is that the effect size is extremely high for the correlation between uh, MDS and uh, the absorption subscale of the DS. The relationship between chronic childhood trauma and dissociative psychopathology uh, uh, is very well documented. Uh, we recently also showed that maladaptive daydreaming plays a, an important role in this relationship as a mediator. We also noted that when we looked at a particular form of childhood adversities, maladaptive daydreaming showed a significant relationship only to emotional neglect. So neglected children, you know, abused children, those who are sexually uh, uh, exploited or physically abused, must pay attention to the threats out there. So their focus naturally would not be inward, but uh, as they're being abused or getting ready for the traumatic experiences, the repeated traumatic experiences, they must monitor their behavior to minimize getting hurt. So, and the, so they focus outwardly. In the psychological neglect, there's nothing happening, nothing much happening, uh, particularly not much of what is needed is happening. So it, is, it makes sense that individuals who are neglected would tend to soothe themselves uh, in their imagination. But more specifically, the mediation role is even more evident when we look at the role of maladaptive daydreaming in the relationship between childhood neglect and dissociation, as I said. And what is, why is that? I, I, have just, um, I have just explained, but the slide shows that it, can you see the, uh, the bottom left, emotional neglect, shows even a stronger relationship and a stronger role as a mediator between uh, uh, I mean, maladaptive daydreaming, that is, uh, is, 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 plays an important role there um, when emotional neglect is the source of the, uh, of, of the distress. This is not to say that maladaptive daydreaming does not interact with more aggressive form of childhood abuse, of course, and we have evidence that uh, the rates of this uh, mental activity is high among survivors of childhood sexual abuse compared to controls. <coughs> so this is a, a suggested etiological model of how this develops. We believe that maladaptive daydreaming is based on an innate capacity. Uh, the capacity itself is not pathological, is not a disorder. Uh, it, rather, it could be seen as a talent or, or a gift. And um, um, and could be enjoyed when used in moderation, like gambling, like drinking, like any type of uh, addiction. Uh, so I believe um, um, that something needs to happen, uh, and what, what is usually happening, we have this discovery of this inner world it is extremely rewarding, so the tendency is to repeat it, but when the uh, external reality is uh, painful, uh, inescapable, intolerable, 
the motivation to engage in this highly accessible form of uh, creating an, uh, an alternative inner world is uh, ever more rewarding. Uh, but we do need to coin um, another term for this non-pathological form of intense, immersive, absorptive daydreaming that I call the trait. The trait itself, again, is not abnormal. It, it, and I have a young colleague from Australia, Melina West, and she suggested the term immersive daydreaming to describe um, this uh, this capacity. <coughs> so immersive daydreamings are not only different from a regular uh, daydreaming, it also differentiates, um, uh, it's also different or uh, from maladaptive daydreaming. I mean, I'm talking about the immersive daydreaming. Uh, <coughs> they are uh, maladaptive daydreamers um, are experiencing more difficulties in emotion regulation than the other groups, but they also tend to be more empathic and they have fewer creative outputs. You can see that uh, when you look at um, uh, these are three groups, non-MD, non immersive uh, daydream uh, daydreamers, and uh, maladaptive daydreamers, you see that in terms of creativity, uh, they're less creative. Uh, but again, this measure uh, gauged the uh, creative output, not the, the, not the mental activity. So apparently, the being engaged extensively in daydreaming uh, is at the expense of materializing the good ideas that come, come into mind when one daydreams. Uh, so the ability to translate the creativity into action is compromised when all one does is, uh, uh, to use a term uh, I've heard from people I've interviewed, waste their life away in daydreaming. That does not... Um, it is not commensurate with uh, being present and uh, implementing the ideas. So like dissociative disorders, maladaptive daydreaming produces only a limited sense of relief and actually can be detrimental to mental health on the long run. So here are some evidence about the unhelpful impact of maladaptive daydreaming on um, survivors of childhood sexual abuse. They score higher on maladaptive daydreamer dreaming. And survivors of childhood sexual abuse with probable maladaptive daydreaming, we have a cutoff score um, that can identify people who are suspected for having as having maladaptive daydreaming, they scored higher on social phobia, on social isolation, depression, anxiety, stress symptoms, compared to survivors without suspected maladaptive daydreaming. So that all of that together implies that maladaptive daydreaming exacerbates, on the long run, exacerbates psychosocial problems linked with childhood sexual abuse. Um, what is important uh, to say that some of the sources of, of distress are not necessarily historical and not uh, rooted in childhood, but because of the um, uh, chain effect, a lot, of the, a lot of the problems are experienced in the present. Uh, many maladaptive daydreamers have other numerous other current problems suggesting, as our model implies, that the capacity for inner soothing can be helpful, at least in the short run, uh, by mitigating um, concurrent problems um, such as social anxiety. But uh, socially anxious maladaptive daydreamers who fantasize social success um, and 
by overdoing this kind of mental activity, actually contribute to their social isolation. And um, cr that creates further distress that, like in any addiction model, motivates the individuals to s calm themselves down with more daydreaming. So we're talking about a painful present that requires some emotional regulation that could also be related to maladaptive daydreams comorbidity with other psychiatric disorders. And indeed, in a recent study, we found that uh, this is indeed an issue. But let me say that comorbidity is common in many, uh, if not all, D DSM disorders. For example, disruptive mood regulation. Uh, it's a DSM disorder. It occurred with another disorder, depending on the study, 62% to 92% of the time. So maladaptive daydreaming like, daydreaming, like other DSM disorders, uh, is highly comorbid. 77% uh, comorbidity with attention deficit disorder, the inattentive type. 71% comorbidity with anxiety disorders, 67% comorbidity with depressive disorders, and 54% comorbidity with OCD spectrum disorders. So clearly, for those who are still skeptical about maladaptive daydreaming being a pathological form of daydreaming, this kind of evidence uh, I think is quite convincing uh, with regard to the abnormality of, of, of this condition. Still, childhood trauma is reported only by 27% of uh, people with maladaptive daydreaming and, and not reported conversely by 73%. So for those listening to and watching this instructional video, who are interested in uh, dissociative identity disorder, I would suggest that the ability to fantasize effectively that the trauma is not happening to me, but to her, quote unquote, requires a capacity to create an alternative internal reality that could share uh, similar mental mechanisms with maladaptive daydreaming. I, I see a great similarity there, uh, etiologically. As uh, one colleague who probably watched, uh, will be watching this, uh, this uh, uh, lecture said, she uh, brazingly suggested that DAD could be a subtype of maladaptive daydreaming. At any rate, uh, Trauma is not a necessary condition for maladaptive daydreaming. So is it a, sort of a, uh, a, um, an addictive uh, disorder? People who have the trait for immersive fantasy simply like it. It's a built-in virtual reality, highly accessible, legal. And they like it so much that they want to spend more time immersed in it, and they prefer this activity to the more boring chores of daily life. It's comforting, enjoyable, a pastime. It would be upsetting for me uh, if I couldn't ac access it. I prefer daydreaming because my life is boring, and so on and so forth. At any rate, when we consider treatment goals, we must bear in mind that, that our goal is not to abolish it completely, like the use of heroin. We don't want to use heroin uh, recreationally. But here we're talking about a normal behavior of ubiquitous, highly prevalent, in this case also very intense in terms of the vividness and sense of presence it creates. Uh, but we don't want to turn it into zero. We want to help people, and that's what we're trying to develop, uh, attain uh, better regulating mechanisms so they could uh, tune in and out into this, into this uh, mental ability at will, but also in a controlled manner that will allow them to lead success, a successful life. 
So the uh, phrasing of, of, the, of the, 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 the uh, description of maladaptive daydreaming as an addiction is, uh, is out there. It's used by the consumers themselves. Some of them have created website to address this issue and regard it as an addiction. It could also be construed as an OCD spectrum disorder. So many maladaptive daydreamers describe a need to repeat their fantasy. Some explain it as a need to perfect it. It's not quite right, so they repeat it over and over again. Um, and in a recent uh, longitudinal study a daily, with daily measures, we found that obsessive compulsive symptoms were the only consistent temporal antecedent of maladaptive daydreaming. It came before, so it, uh, closely related. OCD, uh, to remind you, was also implicated in the only medication study on maladaptive daydreaming. I talked about it earlier. So the question at hand is the ontological quandary. What is maladaptive daydreaming and what is it probably not? Uh, how is it related to sluggish cognitive tempo? Well, to put it in short, unlike sluggish cognitive tempo, maladaptive daydreaming does not involve any lethargy, mental or physical. So it's, there's some overlap, but it's definitely not that. Uh, how is it related to mind wandering? <coughs> well, mind wandering has been shown that um, uh, it's associated with increased fidgeting. So uh, we have that slight um, um, uh, kinesthetic component. But by contrast, um, the uh, interest, attention, and visual engagement lead to non-instrumental movement inhibition. So maladaptive daydreaming is characterized in contrast by interest, attention, and internal visual engagement, and is associated with purposeful stereotypical movement, uh, and is not task negative. This is the task. The fantasy is the task. Um, so here is a, a recent email I received. I also experienced the craving and the compulsion. However, I find that maladaptive daydreaming requires a huge amount of mental energy, which I don't have. As I feel a compulsion to, to daydreaming, I feel that I am missing the fuel for it. So it, it's an effort. It requires a purposeful effort. So it's not a resting phase of the brain, and it, it's, to my mind, probably not uh, mind-wandering. Um, <coughs> and default mode network is, again, the brain mechanisms that fire up, light up during uh, mind-wandering. Um, it has been shown to be negatively correlated with other networks in the brain, such as attention networks. And maladaptive daydreaming requires active, purposeful mental activity. So I would be surprised if the default mode network is activated during maladaptive daydreaming. Uh, and so here we have the question of, is it a form, a later and adult form of stereotypical movement disorder or intense imagery movement? So could intense imagery movement be one etiological pathway leading to maladaptive daydreaming? Is, is this a precursor to maladaptive? We don't know the answers to that yet, and only future research will shed light on it. But um, the, the questions have been addressed already. Roger Freeman in Canada, and again, Sally Robinson, uh, and her team um, in, in London, UK, um, with uh, Tammy Hederly as the director of that, uh, of that unit. Um, so what is it? 
Uh, again, this is um, cutting edge science. We are uh, on an exploratory uh, phase still. Uh, science in its infancy. Is it a stress related disorder? Is it a, a dissociative disorder? Is it a behavioral addiction? Is it an OCD spectrum disorder? Is it an attention deficit disorder? Remember, we had a 77% uh, comorbidity with uh, ADHD inattentive type. Or perhaps a combination of the above. We still don't know. Uh, so you, the viewers, might have different and many more research questions, uh, but uh, here is a suggested start for uh, an interdisciplinary scientific dialogue, you know, with uh, scientists who might be watching this. In the meantime, as a scientist practitioner, I have moved on to develop a preliminary treatment model based on what we know thus far about maladaptive daydreaming. I described it um, in a case study uh, published in uh, the clinical, a new clinical journal of my international society, the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation. And this particular uh, um, uh, 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 treatment consists of modes that were tailored to suit the needs of the client. First of all, we had motivational interviewing. It's an important component in the treatment of addiction and the support of abstinence because it addresses the motivation that is so badly needed in the battle against the craving for the rewards associated with uh, addictive behavior. So that, that was an important component. Uh, we also um, um, used uh, CBT elements. Um, um, it is important to understand the patterns of maladaptive daydreaming, the, time, the timeline circumstances that lead to this behavior. So uh, alternative activities that are incompatible with daydreaming could be employed. Um, the waste of time that this particular client uh, was concerned about was uh, counteracted with careful daily activity planning um, and also reinforcing the uh, positive outcome. And also negatively, re uh, not negatively reinforced, but else internally punishing by creating um, unfavorable uh, outcome to the to the fantasy, so they will not be as rewarding. So these are some CBT principles we used. Also, self reinforcement for successes, uh, accountability was um, introduced. The patient was encouraged to text me, and uh, the, the you know the outcome of his uh, efforts and keeping a daily records, uh, employing coping statements. Uh, and also mindfulness training. Mindfulness training was to this patient the most effective uh, uh, treatment module. Um, it is a logical antidote to uh, daydreaming as it is an anchoring mental activity that redirects the mental focus from internal absorption to mindful awareness of the external reality. So uh, in this particular patient, <coughs> um, in, in, in his case, he also was a, a concerned about uh, compulsive internet use, described in blue. And he added the reduction of internet use as an important secondary goal. Note that the complete elimination of daydreaming is not a reasonable goal we aimed at, and neither is the complete elimination of internet use a, a reasonable goal to uh, achieve. Uh, but as you can see visually, um, uh, the patients seem to have gained from, from this treatment, and uh, a lot of the gains were s still maintained at follow-up. Um, here is here are the result from um, a self-report of problems in daily functioning, indicating again a stable improvement in daily functioning. That's that's what's so important. I mean, a person can fantasize all that he or she wants, but as long as they don't suffer 
and continue to uh, meet their uh, daily obligations and self-expectations. Um, the, these are the scores of the maladaptive daydreaming scale. They indicate a post-treatment reduction followed by a small rebound, probably indicating uh, the craving for maladaptive, for, for, for daydreaming that increased the, the distress. I remember this is what he was reporting, he, which suggests to me that this might be, a, um, might meet the definitions of, uh, of an addiction. Um, what is shown here is uh, support for the idea that the intervention suppressed the maladaptive daydreaming behavior, but not the craving. This is demonstrated in this chart. The client continues. This is this chart measures the pleasure derived from from this absorptive form of daydreaming, and what the the, the figure shows that this client is clearly at risk for a relapse because at, uh, at the end of treatment and at follow-up, he continued to report intense pleasure derived from his immersive daydreaming. Okay, we also uh, submitted a, a paper that I, I hope uh, and I'm very confident will be published uh, showing um, the artistic expression of maladaptive daydreaming and how it uh, represents itself in the drawing. For example, this picture represents a recurrent maladaptive daydreaming theme, probably of compensatory nature. The person here is at the center of attention, speaking or lecturing in front of a crowd. This is a recurrent theme of her own daydreaming and probably in contrast to an otherwise socially avoidant nature. This artistic expression of maladaptive daydreaming, uh, in this uh, picture you see the respondent describing how he feels weighed down by his large wobbly head that leans in the opposite direction of his destination. He wants to move forward, to, um, his hands are extended forward and his desired destination includes, as he has written there uh, on, on these boxes or books, goals, success, relationships, etc., all the hallmarks of good functioning. But he seems to be way down in the opposite direction. This is a humoristic representation of maladaptive daydreaming experienced as an, an internal entertainment system. When other people require electricity to power their entertainment system, this person can be happily amused uh, while a cord to external power is unplugged. In this representation of maladaptive daydreaming experience, the respondent cuts his or her ties with society, with the scissors, and all the values society represents. I also notice that the person feels criticized by society for his or her maladaptive daydreaming. <coughs> and also please note that while society is depicted in gray monochrome, the maladaptive daydreaming world, including the person herself, is colorful and rich. Here is a similar uh, pictorial th uh, uh, element. Here is a self-representation of the person in her bed, immersed in a daydreaming bubble listening to music and surrounded by colorful spheres. That's her daydreaming world. Outside the colorful bubble is a gray world with signifiers of the passing time, social life, basic needs, hobbies, all locked out and ignored. Here is a depiction of a dreamy character immersed in her colorful fantasy world where rabbits do not cease from jumping out of the hat. Perhaps it's a representation of the loss of control over the magic of immersive daydreaming. 
And finally, a wonderful illustration of the gap between fantasy world and the gray monochrome reality. This is again a, re a, a recurrent theme in the artwork of Maladaptive Daydreamers that conveys the dramatic contrast between the rich, vivid, colorful world of fantasy and the grayish reality. And also note that the daydreamer is involved in movement, she's not still, and seems quite happy. So here's a list of what we know thus far. I will not uh, repeat it, but uh, we are um, accumulating knowledge. Uh, we are continuing to study this, and I'm, I'm sure that uh, within one year of the making of this uh, video, this will be obsolete because we would have known, uh, we would know much more. Still, open questions remain, you know. Uh, um, these are the frontiers of our knowledge. We need more scientists, more practitioners to join our efforts of generating and disseminating knowledge. We need uh, the continued support of the maladaptive daydreaming community. They've been wonderful in volunteering themselves to take part in our study. Uh, but again, most of all, we need more scholars, more academics to join the study. The, the effort of research in this field. Please visit our website to learn more about maladaptive daydreaming and join us either as consumers or researchers. You can, uh, if you want to receive updates, you can register online. So for October 2018, that is uh, uh, the latest update on the state of the art of, of uh, the knowledge on maladaptive daydreaming. So stay tuned. Bye-bye.